And I'm going to mute Thank everybody you. here, including you, Casey, just giving you the heads up. And I hope if everybody heard that all of my patients and def and everybody listening to this is going to go on the long walk, not the short walk. That's important <clears throat> in case you missed that memo. Well, welcome back. I'll get started because there were a lot of questions that were actually um, sent in in email. Um, for those of you who know me, or for those of you, for those of you who know me, you know me. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Timothy Licklider. I am a so-called movement disorder specialist here at Allegheny Health Network, sitting in my office at Allegheny General. Um, and basically, this is a question and answer session. So, if you have questions type them into the chat box. I'll go through the ones that I got in my email first, and then I'll get to the ones in the chat box, and we'll have a little bit of fun here, because that's what we do. A few caveats that I always throw out there is this is kind of a general forum, general questions. This is not a great place to get individualized uh, treatment. So, you know, throwing out a question like, oh, I have this, and this is what I'm on. What do you think I should do next? I'm going to say that's a great question for your doctor. You should probably ask them. Uh, the second thing I always throw out is everything you hear is my opinion. Uh, I have a lot of opinions. Um, I like to think my opinions are based as factual as possible. Sometimes I make stuff up. I'll usually throw up some quotation marks if I'm telling you I'm making stuff up. Um, but if you do go to a different neurologist or if you go to a different movement disorder specialist, they may have different opinions from me. Um, and so take take it for what it is worth. Um, and the, with that, I will get started and start answering some questions. So throw in some questions uh, and I'll answer them along the way. Uh, so the first one I got was, was a pretty common question that I get and something that I see pretty frequently, which is what is vascular Parkinsonism? And for this, I actually have to take one quick step back, uh, which is what is the difference? And this is a question I know I've talked about before, but it's worth reiterating because it's confusing. So what's the difference between Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonism? And that's a common question that I get all the time. And so here's the, the easiest breakdown I can give you. So Parkinsonism is the symptoms of Parkinson's. It's tremor, it's stiffness, it's slowness of movement, it's balance problems. It's the motor symptoms, which are what we use to make the diagnosis. Anybody who has those symptoms has Parkinsonism. The most common cause of Parkinsonism is Parkinson's disease or idiopathic Parkinson's disease, which is basically what I describe as typical disease, typical onset, typical presentation, typical response to medicine, typical progression. Anybody who does not fall into that typical storyline, I usually label as Parkinsonism. Or you could say atypical Parkinsonism. There's a few Parkinson's plus conditions, which I won't get into just yet. Um, I think there was a question about one of them a little bit later, but these are different conditions, not necessarily typical Parkinson's disease. Parkinsonism are, and, and Parkinson's disease is usually typical. It's not caused by anything as far as we know. It responds to medicines in a certain fashion. This is what we typically think about. If there is an underlying cause of the symptoms, say vascular disease, say medications or drug induced, then it's not Parkinson's disease, it's Parkinsonism. Vascular Parkinsonism is one of the more common Parkinson's like conditions that doesn't fall into the obvious or typical category of Parkinson's disease. When I say vascular Parkinsonism, it usually means there's a collection of things that I can see on an MRI scan or on a picture, which shows significant vascular changes. So when I look at an MRI scan, I, and I usually show people these pictures in the in the office, I say, this is what color it's supposed to be, which is kind of this gray color, and you see these white spots. And when we think about vascular Parkinsonism, there's usually a lot of white spots. If you have enough white spots, it can actually give you some Parkinson symptoms, and this is what we would classify as vascular Parkinsonism. A lot of times, vascular Parkinsonism tends to happen in a little bit older population, although it doesn't have to, and it oftentimes, but not always, presents more with water walking imbalance problems than it does with typical tremors and stiffness. Sometimes it's called lower half Parkinsonism because it tends to have more leg or walking problems, more difficulty picking up your feet than the typical tremors and stiffness and things that you have when you're sitting there. Therefore, that's what I'm usually referring to if I say somebody has vascular Parkinsonism. It's, it's an atypical form of Parkinson's. It's not Parkinson's disease. It's usually caused by changes that I can see on the brain when I look at a picture. 
Um, and and the, 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 the difficulty is it's harder to treat. It does not respond to the medicines the same way typical Parkinson's disease does. Walking imbalance is usually impacted a little bit more. And so it becomes a little bit more challenging. The end result is we still do the same things. I still use the same handful of medicines. I still recommend a ton of exercise and therapy. And so the, the end result of what we do isn't much different, but that's what I mean when I say vascular Parkinsonism. And that's also how I tell the difference between vascular Parkinsonism and Parkinson's disease. That's kind of the major differences. And, and these are all the questions that I'm following up with that, are, that were in the email. Um, and, and the main test that points me in that direction is the MRI scan. If I do an MRI scan in somebody who has typical Parkinson's disease, which I don't always do imaging studies in people who have typical Parkinson's disease, I usually do imaging studies in people who have something that's just a little bit off, a little bit different, a little bit unusual. And when I do the MRI in these patients and I see a lot of vascular changes on MRI, that's really the test that helps me distinguish between the two. Again, the symptoms are sometimes different, but not always. Um, and, and again, what we do for them usually isn't much different. It's just the response and the progression is a little bit different in vascular Parkinsonism. <laughs> the last question I had on this kind of cluster was, can I speak on the use of Nuplazid uh, or Pimavanserin for the Parkinson's disease hallucinations? So Nuplazid is actually the only FDA approved medicine for Parkinson's disease psychosis. Um, if you go back historically, we've used a lot of Clozaril back in the day, but the problem with Clozaril is it requires a whole bunch of blood work, so it's not very utilized, and Seroquel, which you'll see all the time. Um, but those medicines actually don't have an FDA approval for the hallucinations in Parkinson's disease. Nuplazid is really the only medicine that does. The benefit to Nuplazid is that it doesn't necessarily work on the dopamine system. It works more on serotonin. And so you, you don't necessarily run the risk of causing worsening of Parkinson's symptoms or stiffness or tremors or things like that as you can with the Seroquel. The hardest part about Nuplazid is sometimes getting it covered. Again, you guys know this better than any of us is insurances dictate everything I do. Um, I, I get very, I get some say, but ultimately your insurer is who decides what you can and can't do. Um, and, and sometimes that's a problem for Nuplazid. Um, but I do like it. It does help. I use it a lot in patients who have hallucinations, and that's where you'll see it used because that really is what it's approved for. All right. I thought this was an interesting question. If, if your symptoms have not been well controlled over a period of time, does it become harder to control them or reverse the severity? I thought, you know, I thought about that question. At first glance, I'd say, oh, well, I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, it's going to make everything worse. But as I thought more through the question and, and more of the kind of under underlying parts of the questions, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I guess it depends on why they haven't been well controlled over a period of time. Is that because you're not taking your medicine? Is that because you're not exercising or doing the other things that I want you to do? Or is it really because I'm trying and giving you medicine and we're doing things and they're just not working? So those are actually two different things. If I give you one medicine or two medicines or a couple of medicines and we're not having a lot of success, that definitely doesn't make me feel great about the third medicine or the fourth medicine. You know, believe it or not, I'm not holding back on you guys with the best thing just just as to surprise you with it a little bit later. Uh, that's not exactly how I like to do things. Um, I really am giving you the medicines first, second, third that I think are the best choices to try to get you doing better. Um, and, and so if you're not really responding to the medicines, I'm not all that optimistic with the, it doesn't mean I don't try them and, and I use combinations of things and I escalate dosages of things because the medicines are still the main treatment strategy that I have. But if they're not responding early on, it doesn't make me feel great as to see how we're going to go down the road. Doesn't mean it's impossible. I've had some people not respond to one medicine and do better when I give them something else. Um, but I do think it makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, and, and so, again, I, I think I, if that's what you're looking for in the answer to that question, then that's how I would answer it. If it's really just that we haven't really escalated the dose or been more aggressive or you haven't been taking it, then I'm less concerned that, OK, we can still get control of your symptoms or we can still do well. But if it really is that you're not responding to the medicine all that well, that makes it much harder as we go down the road. Do I find that amantadine is a good option for treating Parkinson's? But yeah, I use tons of amantadine in my patients, um, but I use it for a reason. And, and so again, at the end of the day, it comes down to everything that I do from a patient standpoint, from a treatment standpoint, is generally for a reason. 
each drug that I add, this is why it's so hard for medical students and for residents when they come to my office to try to understand the medications, because yes, you can, there's a lot of different choices and you can use a lot of them interchangeably, but you will see me use certain things for certain problems. So take amantadine. I, I like to use amantadine for people who are having more walking and balance problems. Maybe it works a little bit better for that. Um, amantadine also maybe gives people a little bit of a boost of energy, although not tremendously. And so you'll see me use it in those instances. Amantadine is also the one medicine I have that tends to lower dyskinesias. This is where Gokavri comes into play, which is an extended release of amantadine. Um, and so if I have somebody who needs a little bit more medicine, but is dyskinetic, can't stop moving, then amantadine may be a reasonable choice. Um, but understanding the logic of how we use the medicines is a little bit challenging because there's oftentimes multiple different ways we can solve each problem. But the short answer to your question is, yes, I think amantadine is a reasonable option. No, I don't think it's a solution or a fix for everything, but in the right patient for the right reason, I do use amantadine quite frequently. I, I thought this was actually an incredibly interesting question. And I'm not going to lie, I honestly don't know the answer to this question. So some of what I'm probably going to say is going to be made up. What causes some people with Parkinson's to fall? And the fall, and that I can answer. But what the follow-up question was, what takes place in the brain? And that I'm honestly not sure of. Um, so the downside here is, and we're doing a little bit more of this with the precept and the, and the recordings that we can do with some of the deep brain stimulators, but we're not actually able to tell what the brain is doing in real time. So in research, there's some functional MRIs and they can do kind of some things, but there's no good way to see what the brain is doing while you're actively moving, doing things, walking, freezing, falling. Um, and, and so everything that we do is, is a little bit of a guess, is a little bit of an extrapolation. Um, and so that's why I thought this was a really interesting question. I'm, I'm honestly not sure what's going on in your brain that makes you fall, makes you lose balance. You know, we know that there's certain firing patterns in different areas of the brain. This is what we are learning through some of the DBSs that can record and measure and things like that. Um, and those are the things that we're using to get to what's called a closed loop deep brain stimulator, which we're getting closer to. Um, but they don't measure everything and they don't measure outside of the small area that the deep brain stimulator lead is placed. And so, you know, we don't actually have a lot of answers to these kinds of questions. We know that the deeper structures of the brain called the basal ganglia, which is a combination of different nuclei, are involved. We know the outer parts of the brain, the cortex, where you do your thinking and things like that are involved. We know the cerebellum is involved. That's often the area that we think about in balance and coordinated movement. Um, and we're not entirely sure what the firing patterns are or how these things change for different symptoms or different parts of the disease. If I were guessing, and this is definitely a made up thing, this is not fact, this is my opinion and my guess, is that it's probably the circuitry to the cerebellum, which again is what controls coordinated movement, walking and balance, that's impacted and causes people to fall. Um, that firing pattern is just not correct. And, and what's interesting is there's some data to suggest that this isn't necessarily dopamine driven, which again, if you think about or you read about in Parkinson's disease, dopamine, 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 everything's about dopamine. But it turns out there's a whole lot of other chemicals that are impacted in Parkinson's disease as well, including acetylcholine, which actually runs or is more of a chemical involved in cerebellar pathways. And so the short answer to your question is that I honestly don't know what's going on at any given time in the brain that leads to loss of balance leads to falling. Um, but I think it has to do with these abnormal circuitry patterns that are firing incorrectly. And those are the things we're just starting to understand. We're just starting tip of the iceberg stuff before we really get to the baseline. Now, there's a whole lot of other things that actually lead to falling, freezing or hesitating, where your top half gets going and your bottom half doesn't. Um, dizziness, loss of balance, tripping, not paying attention. Again, writing reflexes aren't correct. There's a whole lot of other physical reasons why people fall. But as to what's actually going on in the brain, that's a much more difficult question, and I'm not sure. Someday I'll be able to answer that question, but today is not that day. 
And the doc give a differential diagnostic criteria for Parkinson's disease versus Lewy body disease. I think my spouse may have been misdiagnosed, which is not actually all that uncommon. When you live in my world and you don't have a lot of tests that are black and white, uh, we're wrong all the time. So actually, interestingly, as an aside, a, a recent research paper came out that we are doing better, um, but we're still not all, the right, all that great, particularly early in the course of disease. <laughs> So Lewy body disease is one of the Parkinson's plus conditions. So when I, when I mentioned that a little bit ago, where the, the Parkinsonisms, the atypical Parkinsonism, the Parkinson's plus conditions, these are all Parkinson's disease-like conditions that would not be classified as typical Parkinson's disease because they don't have either the same trajectory, the same typical response to medicine. They come with these other things. There's generally thought, we generally think about four Parkinson's plus conditions there, and I'll just list them here. If this is recorded, you can always come back to it. Progressive supranuclear palsy, multiple systems atrophy, cortical basal ganglionic degeneration or cortical basal syndrome, and diffuse Lewy body disease. Lewy body disease, Lewy body dementia. It doesn't matter what you call it. It's all the same thing. Lewy body disease is, is a tough one because it looks a lot like Parkinson's disease, much like the other conditions do. But it comes with the plus. It comes with the other things. And probably the one thing that tips me towards the diagnosis of Lewy body disease versus the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is the hallucinations. This is probably the most obvious, the most common, the most typical thing that people run into in Lewy body disease. And, and now everybody here is going to say, well, wait a second. You told me I have Parkinson's disease and I have hallucinations. You're not wrong. Parkinson's disease patients can have hallucinations. This is why we have new plasid. The difference is the timing and the cause. So people with Lewy body disease tend to have prominent visual hallucinations early in the course of disease. And when I'm really, the only time I'm really confident or, or I want to say definitive because I'm never definitive, but really confident in the diagnosis of Lewy body disease is when the hallucinations are there before or without any medications. So we think in Parkinson's disease, it's the medications that lead to the hallucinations. And therefore, one of the solutions for the hallucinations is to decrease the medications. In Lewy body disease, the cause of the hallucinations is the disease itself. And, and so if I have somebody who comes to me who looks like they have Parkinson's disease, but they're already hallucinating, or they hallucinate not or before I put them on any medicines, or even if they start having pretty prominent or common or recurrent hallucinations on low doses of medicine, that's what usually tips me towards the idea of Lewy body disease. They can also get some memory problems and cognitive problems. They can also have blood pressure fluctuations. They tend to fluctuate throughout the day. There's other things that tip us in that direction, but probably the one thing that makes me feel the most confident about that type of a diagnosis are the hallucinations and the hallucinations outside of the setting of the typical medicines that I use for Parkinson's disease. Because once I start putting people from a Parkinson's disease standpoint on medications, all bets are off. All of the medicines that I use in Parkinson's disease can cause hallucinations and therefore it clouds the picture. It makes it a little bit more challenging and a little bit more convoluted or difficult. If you're already having hallucinations before or not on any medications, that would definitely point me in the direction of something like a Lewy body disease. I love this question. Uh, I don't know the answer to this question either, but uh, I'm going to bring it out. So can anything be done when your feet won't move? Every single person here wants to know the answer to that question. Uh, I mean, realistically, yes and no. So freezing of gait, gait hesitation, which is really where you either upon standing and trying to initiate walking or even in the midst of walking, your feet get stuck, that you can't initiate a step. You can't pick up your feet. Your top half goes forward, but your feet get stuck. These are all descriptions that I get of it. It's actually a really hard problem to treat, particularly from a medication standpoint. The, the best thing for freezing of gait is cueing. Uh, and, and cueing is something that anybody can learn. Physical therapists work on this all the time. And, and I describe it when I'm in the office. So when you get stuck, what do you do? A lot of people count one, two, one, two, left, right. Or they talk to themselves. They say, take a big step. This is also where some devices were created, where the laser line, uh, the next stride, or you know, there's actually shoes that will put a laser line in, in front of you. You know, those kind of things tend to help get people unstuck because you can simplify the movement. Taking one step is a lot easier than 
and then ambulating and walking as a whole. Um, you know, a lot of people start marching. Um, some people, you know, do variety of things. They can, you know, think in their head or talk out loud to try to get themselves unstuck. Some people, a caregiver just comes and touches them on the shoulder. It gets them unstuck. But cueing is probably the best and most tried and true way for freezing of gait. Now, the problem with that is by the time you get to the queuing, you've already frozen. And obviously, the biggest problem is freezing has statistically and fairly convincingly been shown to lead to falling. Uh, and as you've, if you're my patient, you hear me talk about this all the time. If we've talked about it on here, you've heard me talk about it all the time. Falling is the most dangerous problem. Falling is the number one way my patients end up in the hospital, and the hospital is not where you want to be. And, and so the problem with queuing is you've already froze and th hopefully you haven't fallen yet. And so the key to freezing of gait or gait hesitation is how do we prevent it? And that is a much more difficult problem. It's not something that responds all that well to medicine, although we will try increasing, changing the frequency, working on the medicines, uh, increasing the doses, spreading it out, making it more frequent. We'll try all kinds of different things. I'll try medicines that you wouldn't even think of sometimes from a freezing of gait standpoint. Not that any of them have really have a lot of evidence or pr proven you know, effectiveness in freezing of gait, but because it's such a dangerous problem, we do have to try to work on it. Again, hopefully that answers the question. The key is really trying to avoid it, which is easier said than done. But if you do end up in that position where you're stuck, A, talk to yourself. And I talk to myself all the time, get used to it. It's a normal thing. Um, and B, we're probably going to get you to physical therapy to really work on this because that is the best way to try to get unstuck. And then the last one that I, I think the last one, the last one that I had emailed to me relatively recently was actually about hiccups. Um, my husband, husband gets a lot of hiccups. I read that it could be because of his Parkinson's medicine. He gets these for days along with extra mouth secretions. Is there anything we can try? And so I, I'm going to break it into two actually a little bit different things. So hiccups are tough. Um, hiccups can actually be pathological. They can come from the brain. Uh, generally in the area of the brain stem or, or the back part of the brain, there's an area that can actually trigger hiccups. And, and I've seen patients that have had continual hiccups for years. Um, not much fun. The hard part is, is again, the medicines that we use for that, which aren't that good, are things like Thorazine, uh, antipsychotics. Um, and the downside is, is they all block dopamine and they all make Parkinson's symptoms worse. So that's going to be a tough one uh, from a hiccup standpoint. Now, hiccups can also come from the diaphragm. And so, again, if there's anywhere along the GI tract or the, the vagus nerve, these are things that we might want to look into. If it really is secretions, because that was the second part of it, which is very common in my Parkinson's disease patient, that's a little bit different. So secretions are, are a common complaint that I get um, because a lot of things do thicken up. You, you tend to sit with your mouth open and then it dries up secretions and makes them a little bit thicker. You also tend to sit flexed forward and gravity takes effect. But I have a lot of pe people that get uh, drooling or, or uh, hypersalivation. I get a lot of runny nose, particularly when I'm eating, things like that. So, so the secretion glands really are overactive in people with Parkinson's disease. And so if that's what's leading to the hiccups, that's a little bit different. Sometimes I'll use medicines for that. You'll see me use things like glycopyrrolate, which is robinol. Um, or I'll also do botulinum toxin injections. So I don't usually use Botox. I usually do myoblock, although Botox and ZMN are also approved. Um, and that's actually what I've had the best success with from a secretion standpoint. Again, it does mean that we have to come at your face with needles and it kind of is a little bit painful because I do a grid pattern over the glands, but that's actually what I've had the best success with. So coming back to the original question, it's going to be coming to or, or trying to figure out what is the underlying cause and then figuring out if there's something specifically we can do about it. If it really is the secretions, I think that might be a little bit easier and we might have a little bit better success treating that as opposed to the, if it really is just from the disease. I don't know that I've ever seen it come from the medicines. I'd have to look that one up um, and see if it's listed as a side effect. Um, you can get ventilatory dyskinesias as a side effect of the medicine. So just, just like you can kind of get squirmy movements, some patients do kind of get a shortness of breath sensation or, or a cutoff of their breath, which is a ventilatory dyskinesia. Sometimes that can be a side effect of the medicine, but I don't know that I've ever seen specifically hiccups as a side effect of the medicine. Again, I haven't seen everything. I don't know everything, believe me. Um, and so maybe I'll be learning something new here. Um, but I think getting to the getting to the underlying cause is going to be key to that success. 
<clears throat> oh, interesting. My father was running if there's any tips for drooling. Yes, as a matter of fact, there is. Um, and, and so at the end of the day, again, the medicines are sometimes helpful. Um, the downside to the medicines is they come with side effects, systemic side effects. So, so the downside to taking a pill is it doesn't just go to your salivary glands, it goes everywhere. Sometimes it can cause some brain fog or confusion, which again, is not exactly something I'm in a, in a rush to cause. Um, and, and I really do find I've had the best success with injections, as long as you're okay with needles and things like that. Uh, but that's kind of the route that I would get. Sometimes I send people for speech therapy as well. Sometimes they can give you tips and tricks. But really, from a treatment strategy standpoint, um, myoblock is probably my favorite. <clears throat> mm. I have a lot of trouble with orthostatic hypotension. Um, uh, have you found droxidopa to be effective in treating this? And, and so let me take one step back and explain what orthostatic hypotension is. So orthostatic hypotension is when your blood pressure drops when you stand up. Um, so this is not an uncommon thing in Parkinson's disease. In fact, as the disease progresses, this becomes quite a common condition and quite a problematic common condition. It's also extremely common and extremely severe in something called multiple systems atrophy, which again is a Parkinson's plus condition. But even in typical Parkinson's disease, this is a, tr this is a difficulty. <clears throat> Here's why. So one is, as the disease progresses, your autonomic nervous system, which is really the nervous system that controls things that you don't have to think about, is affected. And one of those things you don't normally think about is your blood pressure, right? We don't sit around thinking, oh, I got to boost my blood pressure here. In normal people, whatever that means, when they go from sitting to standing, you have mechanisms, you have receptors that tell your brain, hey, blood is pulling down in your legs. We need to increase your blood pressure or increase your heart rate to feed your brain so I don't pass out. Your brain really likes it when blood flows to it. In Parkinson's disease or several other conditions, that receptor doesn't necessarily work very well or it works very slowly. And so you stand up, blood pulls in your legs, your brain and those receptors are not telling your blood pressure to go up. Your blood pressure actually goes down you get lightheaded, you get dizzy, you pass out. That's orthostatic hypotension in a nutshell. And that's really what I do see in, in multiple systems atrophy every time, but also commonly in Parkinson's disease. The problem is, is again, we don't want you ending up on the ground. I certainly don't want you passing out. Those are really bad ideas. And so what do we do about that? It's not uncommon for a lot of my patients who start off and, and have been treated for high blood pressure for years to end up being able to either decrease or come off of their blood pressure medicines. And so I send a lot of patients back to their primary care doctor, to cardiology, and say, hey, can we get rid of some of these things? Because not only does Parkinson's disease affect your blood pressure, and usually in a low way, most of the medications that I use for Parkinson's disease, including carbidopa, levodopa, also tend to lower your blood pressure. So again, a lot of people who are on medicines to lower their blood pressure because for years they've had high blood pressure oftentimes can either decrease or come off of it. If we get you off of those medicines and you're still having this problem, that's when we add other medicines to you to try to boost your blood pressure. Generally, the three that I'll use most common are midodrine, fluoronef, and droxidopa, which is also called Northera. Um, and I've had some success with each of these medicines. I would say midodrine is probably the one that I've had the best success with because I think it's probably the most potent. Uh, Fluoronef tends to be very weak and requires you to eat a lot of salt and drink a lot of water to make it work. And Northera, I've definitely had some success with, but is a little bit, I don't want to say more challenging to get, but newer than the other ones. So insurances aren't always on my, on my side. Um, but I've had success with all of them. I use all of them. Um, you, you know, it's whatever it takes to prevent those blood pressures from dropping so that we can keep you functioning. And so, yes, I have found droxidopa to be effective in some patients, although it is a lot of trial and error. I was waiting for this question. What are my thoughts on Ambroxol? Um, so Ambroxol, and, and I haven't looked this up recently. I, I looked it up maybe last month, two months ago. I can't remember. But so this is being looked at in Europe. <clears throat> so Ambroxol, I think... But I, I was talking about it earlier today with a patient, and then it made me question it. I thought it was an over-the-counter cough medicine or some sort of cold medicine, but it might be a prescription. I'm not entirely sure. The long story short is this is a cold medicine or a cough medicine that's used in Europe. Um, and, and what they did was they found that it had people who 
took it had a tendency or a lower tendency of developing Parkinson's disease. And if they had Parkinson's disease, it tended to be less progressive. And so they're currently looking at it now to see if it really is effective in Parkinson's disease, disease modifying in Parkinson's disease, so on and so forth. I do not think it is currently available in this country. The problem is, and, and why I've probably talked about on Broxel, I don't know, a dozen times over the past couple of months with, with a variety of my patients. That seems random as I don't know who has my phone number. Um, but anyway, um, I, I've talked about it to a variety of people over the time is I, I don't get too excited about stuff like this. And here's why. I'd have to go back and look, but I think they found Umbroxyl the same way they found correlations with some of the diabetes medicines, the blood pressure medicines, the statins, and how they impact Parkinson's disease. Um, I think this is kind of how they found the gout medicines and, and correlations with uric acid. And, and a lot of these things look promising until they actually get studied scientifically in patients with Parkinson's disease. And then they fizzle out or they don't work. Um, and I feel like we've been burned and let down by so many of these things where somebody finds a correlation between the use of a medicine for something else and, oh, this is going to be the next best thing or the next big break in Parkinson's disease. And then it isn't. And, and so I think this is being looked at in studies now on people with Parkinson's disease over in Europe. Uh, I think these trials are ongoing. And if it works, great. I will be all on board. I will update you guys on what we find. And I will try to come up with a way that we can use it to our advantage. But I definitely don't get excited until I see that data, until I see the studies, until I see the results. I am definitively a doubting Thomas only because we have been burned by these things so many times. There's something that looks promising that has a suggestion that it might be disease modifying in Parkinson's disease, only that when we go test it, it doesn't work. Um, and, and so definitely keep thinking about it. Keep looking at it. Believe me, a lot of my patients pay attention to these things. A lot of people do their own research. They do their own reading. Um, and I'm always interested when you find these things and when you bring these things to me, because I don't hear about everything. Believe me, I learn as much from my patients as I think they do from me. Um, but I always reserve my excitement or my judgment or my, hey, we should do this or, hey, this is a great idea until we really see those final tests, those randomized studies that really do suggest they're beneficial. Then I'll get more excited. Hmm. I don't like this question. I feel like this question takes a dig at everything that I hold dear. We understand that exercise can be helpful. Are there any actual studies that back that up? I feel like this is taking a shot at me. This is I, I'm, I'm offended on so many levels and also physical therapy that may provide some encouragement to do so. And, and the reason why I'm offended is, uh, unfortunately, the short answer is not really. So exercise has been shown in people who are predisposed to developing Parkinson's disease that it delays the onset. That's really what it's been shown. Um, we extrapolate that to people with the disease that it keeps people better longer and it probably is disease modifying. But that is not as proven as I would lead you to believe. If you're my patient, ignore what I just said. It's absolutely proven and it definitively is the right answer. But for everybody else, it is not actually proven that exercise is disease modifying. They're working on it. So UPMC is currently in the SPARKS-3 trial. There's a handful of other trials where they are trying to show that exercise and being active and physical activity really does slow down disease progression and keep you better longer. But those are not published yet. We have... I have... I can honestly say that that has not been definitively answered. My opinion and my experience has been that exercise and physical therapy really do help you do better longer. They tend to lower, you know, the speed of progression. They tend to lower how much medicine I, I need to use and how quickly I need to increase it. They keep people out of trouble, out of the hospital, so on and so forth. In my experience, and now it's been about 10 years where I've been doing this, <clears throat> the people who do the best are the ones that come to me as active as can be. They go to the gym. They do their exercises. They're, they're outside. They're up. They're moving. And I didn't even have to tell them that. 
The people that do the second best are the ones that after I tell them and we go through this, they get on board, they really adopt exercise in an active lifestyle. And then the patients that do worst are the ones that no matter what I tell them for whatever reason, either a, a, an injury or physical ability or motivation, I just can't get them to exercise, they do the worst. That's been my experience. That's what I have seen time and time again. That is what I have dealt with over the past 10 years, which is why I spend the majority of my time talking about being active and exercise. But can I honestly say that there's any study that proves that? No. Would I like to? Yes. Am I hopeful that these studies that are being done right now prove what I think to be true? I can't wait, and I hope they do. The problem is, is research studies on exercise are really, really hard. You know, making sure that people were doing the same amount of exercise, comparing groups. I mean, these are really challenging studies to pull off and to do. Case in point, I have a patient who is indeed in the SPARKS-3 trial. And unfortunately, fortunately, unfortunately, they're in the placebo group. So they're in the non high intensity exercise group. So when they go for wherever they go, I'm not entirely sure what they do in the study, but they go, they run on a treadmill, they do the work, they have them on the low intensity group. The problem is, is every other day he's out there riding his bike for 20 miles a day and he's on the treadmill and he's exercising like a crazy person, which I love, but that's definitely going to skew the results of these studies. And so, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to be a really hard thing to prove. I am hopeful that the studies that are going on are going to give us more data to back up what I always say, but I really do think that exercise is the most important thing and the key to success. So hopefully that's enough encouragement to make you do it. You can definitely throw it in my face that there's no actual research study to suggest that diseases that exercise is disease modifying, but that hurts. Have you heard of a laser treatment to the brain that helps with Parkinson's that is supposed to be done in Mexico and Spain? I have not, actually. Apparently, I need to write this down because this is something that I need to look up. Now, there are the, there is the thing called the high-frequency ultrasound ablation, which is approved for Parkinson's, tremor-predominant Parkinson's disease, where through ultrasound waves, they can burn a small hole in your brain. So I don't know if that's something similar to what they're doing there but I'm not entirely sure of a laser treatment that is being used. I'm going to have to look that up. Um, my guess, and again, this is just a guess. I'm going to have to look it up before I can say is that it's going to come back to the idea of a lesion. So we learned a long time ago that if you put a hole in somebody's brain, you can stop them from shaking, maybe work on some stiffness. Theoretically, although he's not my patient, but I'm pretty sure he mentioned this in one of his books. Michael J. Fox had an ablation done. Um, and the newest way to do an ablation is the high-frequency ultrasound. Um, so I'm wondering if the laser treatment might be an ablation. Um, I'm just not sure. I'm going to have to look that up and see what they're doing in Mexico and Spain. What symptoms are addressed by deep brain stimulator surgery? Tremors, feet freezing, etc. Well, that, that's a good question. Um, Traditionally, we think of the deep brain stimulator as being kind of an extension of medicines. And what I mean by that is we generally think that it works similarly or for similar things that the medicines do. So generally across the board, everybody's a little bit different. So you can't take this for for individual patients. But generally, we think about the medicines, we think about DBS as being good for tremors, stiffness, slowness of movement. We think it less good for things like walking in balance, freezing, speech, swallowing. Um, and, and likewise, I extrapolate that to the deep brain stimulator. It's really good for tremors. It's really good for stiffness. It's not as good for walking in balance. Um, however, can I say that there's never been somebody who got better from a balance standpoint with DBS? No, it, it, there is a small percentage of people that do get better, but it's not usually what I'm aiming for when I'm suggesting or sending somebody for surgery. What I'm looking for for surgery are the more typical things, the tremor predominance, stiffness, not a lot of walking and balance problems, not a lot of speech dysfunction, not a lot of freezing of gait, not a lot of cognitive problems. These are really the ideal people who are suitable for deep brain stimulator surgery. But again, 
there's variations and there's gray areas in all of these these conditions, all of these symptoms. And so would I absolutely not send, send somebody who has freezing of gait for DBS? No, that's silly. Um, there's nothing absolute in my world. I make it up as I go. Um, and, and so again, it really is talking to you about what symptoms you have, what we're trying to accomplish and what we think the chances of success are. Because the last thing I want to do is send a, somebody for brain surgery. I'm not a surgeon. I'm a neurologist. I'm as passive as they come. The last thing I want to do is send somebody for brain surgery to have it not work. And, and so managing expectations, what to expect, what are we aiming for, and what do we think is a, a, a good chance of you know happening are the things that we talk about before we start thinking, okay, let's send you to the operating table and let's send you for surgery. So that's usually the way that I view it. <clears throat> hmm. Is it better to see a neurological eye specialist? There are neuro-ophthalmologists for eye issues, or is the trusted eye doctor just as good for eye issues? In all honesty, my experience is that a trusted eye doctor is probably just as good. And I say that be, not because I, I, I to discount neuro-ophthalmologists, which do tremendous things, but I say that because I've never actually seen any eye doctor of any sort really be all that good for my patients with Parkinson's disease. The vision problems, the double vision, the blurry vision, these are really hard symptoms to work on, to treat. They don't respond to medicines all that well. Eye doctors lose their mind over these things because they'll get you perfect in the chair. Your vision will be great. They'll make you the prescription glasses, the contacts. You go home, you can't see. The fluctuations just drive the ophthalmologist crazy because your vision fluctuates a lot like your symptoms fluctuate. Um, and in all honesty, I've never seen a normal ophthalmologist or a neuro ophthalmologist really help any of my patients all that much. We still use them and I still send my patients to ophthalmology and I still send my patients to neuro ophthalmologists, but it's a frustrating thing for all of us and we're not all that good at it. And so if you have a trusted eye doctor, somebody you've seen, somebody you trust, somebody who knows you, I would say it's probably just as good and going to be just as successful as a neuro ophthalmologist. That's just my opinion. Have I heard of B1 HDT therapy and have I approved it for any of my Parkinson's patients to try? Well, I know there's B1 therapy. I'm not sure what the HDT is, but I have a feeling Donna's going to get on here and tell me about it. Um, the short answer is, is there are looks at vitamins, um, you know, the B vitamins, high doses of these things. And yes, I have had some patients try it. No, I have not had anybody come back and say, wow, that was great. I felt great. That really helped. That really changed my life around. That made me take less medicines. That really solved my problems. Um, and again, at the end of the day, what I like to think about these things are, and this is true for anything that comes to me or any question that comes to me or anybody who comes to me and says, well, what do you think about this supplement? What do you think about this over-the-counter solution? What do you think about this alternative medicine treatment? You know, what do you think about these things that, again, and I'm, believe me, not the know-all of all of these things. And in my training, these are not things that we get great information or training about. My answer is usually the same. And it's pretty consistent. <laughs> Generally, I want three things to be true. So there has to be some scientific rationale behind it. And usually there is. Usually these are free radical scavengers or antioxidants, or they help mitochondria function better, or they clear up cellular debris. There's usually some sort of mechanism behind it that makes sense scientifically. So that's that's question number one. It can't be toxic. And so again, I certainly don't want you doing anything that isn't rigorously studied that's toxic. Now, I, I haven't run into too many toxic supplements or over-the-counter things, and so I don't think that's that big of a deal. But one, there's got to be some science behind it. Two, it can't be toxic. And three is probably the most tricky, which is I don't want it to put you in the poorhouse. You'd be surprised how expensive some of these therapies and some of these treatments are. Um, and I certainly don't want you going in the poorhouse for something that is not definitively tried and true. As long as there's some science behind it, as long as it's not toxic, and as long as you're not putting yourself in the poorhouse, knock yourself out. There really has to be pretty good, solid scientific evidence, something that's going to show up in one of my journals or one of the presentations that I go to or some meeting before I'm going to come recommend it. 
Um, my recommendations usually come from things that are as scientifically proven as possible. Not always possible, but as, po as much as possible. And so I'm never going to recommend a lot of these things because it's going to be hard pressed to get a good trial for them. But if you want to try them, I'm fine with it as long as it's, you know, fulfilling those three criteria, then you just have to make your own decision. Dr. Licklider. Yeah. Go ahead. I knew, you were, based, I knew you were coming. Yeah, this was based on this book. Okay. And she also has, it's by um, Daphne Br uh, Bryan, but it's backed by research by a doctor that died in 2020 of COVID. Out of Italy. It, right. But um, she also has a Facebook page, B1 Therapy for Parkinson's. But that tells you and she consults because she's been on b1 therapy for five years and there's a lot of people that have been on it for five to seven years and they've reduced their symptoms by 70 percent but it's trial and error how you get the dose right but it's over the counter you know and it's uh not that expensive yeah, I've never actually looked. But so again, Facebook does not count as scientific evidence for me. No offense. But the um, doctor in Italy had research. Papers. And I was just about to say the problem that I have with it is every single research study came out of one group. Right. All of the research on this came out of that Italian group. And if it were that good, how come everybody isn't reproducing this? This is the this is the argument that I always have with it. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm not saying it, it it shouldn't be tried or couldn't be tried. I'm simply saying that the evidence is not good enough for me to recommend it. Um, I need to see somebody outside of that Italian group reproduce those results and publish it in our work so that then I can come back and say, hey, look, this really does work. This is class one solid evidence. Let's work on this. We don't have that yet. Well, yeah, and it's not funded because it's not a pharmaceutical. But yeah, nobody. And, not, and this doctors is, are trained on nutrition. It's and this is the problem with supplements: yeah. is to do a, a a good study costs an arm and a leg, and a drug company is not going to recoup the cost cost from B one. So the chances of this actually undergoing a rigorous trial are pretty low. Uh, and this is going to be true for CoQ10. This is going to be true for glutathione. This is going to be true for N-acetylcysteine. This is going to be true for you name it. All of the things that have some science behind them and may actually be beneficial for patients. It's going to be really hard to get good trials for these things because nobody's going to pay for them. Yeah, HDT is high dose thymine. Oh, and I should I should have put that together. And the uh, I was going to spell it out, but I <laughs> you I thought I would have figured that out, but, and I should have. Anyway, but um, no, I hate to use acronyms. That's okay. But, um, and it you have to take a certain type of B one that's not found in many big complexes. I mean, it's a special type right. of B one. So, so I do have some people that are doing it. Again, if anybody tries it and and you know comes back and and gives me some update on it. I'm, I'm all ears and I'm always eager to listen to it. But again, when there's a difference between saying, yes, that's okay, try it. And yes, I recommend you do this. Those are two very different things coming from me. And that's where I draw the line. But the only thing is in her protocol, she says, definitely go to your PCP or your neurologist to get approval to even try this. So and well, I, I don't think there's a large risk. So, but again, <laughs> If you're my patient and you want to try it, come to me and we'll talk about it. Okay. <laughs> Have any of my patients experienced extreme, I won't even say right, but arm and hand weakness? And, and the short answer is yes, um, but that is actually more common in cortical basal syndrome. So we're hitting all the Parkinson's plus conditions here. Um, so it, in a lot of people with Parkinson's disease, one side is worse than the other. It generally starts on one side and that side stays stiffer, slower, shakier, less coordinated throughout. Um, it's not usually dramatically different than the other side after a short period of time, although again, in other conditions like cortical basal syndrome, it can. Um, but I do have some patients that get significant weakness or what I'm going to call is weakness. What it actually usually turns out is lack of coordination um, and difficulty with using it more so than actually muscular strength. But you can get weakness too. And again, it's just something that oftentimes I'll send people to occupational therapy or physical therapy for. Uh, we try medicines, but again, it's a different, it's a difficult thing to try to work on. But the short answer is yes, that's that's not a un I don't want to say it's a common thing, but it's not a rare thing either. 
what are the different kinds of tremors? Um, well, that's a good question. There's a lot of kinds of tremors. So the two most common kinds of tremors are arresting tremor, which is the typical tremor in Parkinson's disease, which is exactly what it sounds like, means it's shake, you're shaking when you're not doing anything, and an action tremor, which is more, I shake when I pour a cup of coffee or I'm eating soup with a spoon, which is more traditionally seen in something called a central tremor. However, there's a whole lot of overlap. In fact, I just read a study that suggested most people with Parkinson's disease end up with some sort of an action tremor at some point or an action component to their tremor. And a lot of people with the central tremor go on to develop a resting tremor, even some Parkinson's disease. And so even though historically we used to think of these things as very, very distinct and very, very different, more and more literature is coming out to suggest that actually – uh, there's a lot more overlap than we think, but those are the two most common types of tremor. And, and why it's important is that at the end of the day, I have medicines for each. So I have some medicines that work for an action tremor. I have some medicines that work for a resting tremor, but I have yet to find a medicine that works for all tremors. And so this is where teasing out or differentiating which type of tremor we're looking at, which type of tremor we're targeting is important when it comes time to pick a medicine. Carbidopa levodopa usually works well for a resting tremor, but it doesn't usually do a whole lot for an action tremor. Things like propranolol, primidone, topiramate, they tend to work better for an action tremor, but they aren't going to do a whole heck of a lot of good for the other Parkinson symptoms, the resting tremor, the stiffness. And so trying to tease that out is actually really important when you're trying to figure out what are we trying to accomplish and what do we want to do. I have also not heard of the evolutionary evolution or healing project. So I'm going to get back to you on that one. I'm going to take, I'm going to jot that one down here to look at. So you'll have to bear with me on that one until next time. That's the one I mentioned last time, but I didn't get you the link to it. See, yet. you know, I thought there was something I was supposed to look up from last time, but I couldn't remember what it was. I kind of had a hard time finding it, but this was just a Facebook thing. Sure. Yeah. But that's it's also that speed of processing I got to work on. That's that's usually what 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 I got to do better at maybe. And that's a webinar. All right. How common is retropulsion? Are there tips to prevent this? Yep. Don't go backwards. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so what is retropulsion? Exa exactly what it sounds like. It's going backwards. Um, actually, one of the tests for Parkinson's disease, which I do not do in my office, is called a pull test. Um, part of the UPDRS or, or our underlying rating scale is that basically I grab you by the shoulders and I pull you backwards. In quote unquote normal people, they should be able to recover fairly easily. But in Parkinson's disease, they keep going backwards to the point where they either run into a wall or fall, which is why I don't do that test in my office. Um, and it's fairly common in people with Parkinson's disease. It's actually much more common, again, to round out the Parkinson's plus conditions in something called progressive supranuclear palsy. But it can be prominent in Parkinson's disease as well. Backwards is a really dangerous and bad direction for a lot of people because, again, when you're going backwards, you tend to keep going backwards. And the only thing you catch yourself when you go down backwards is your head. Um, and so falling backwards is a terrible idea. And, and so... There's not great tips to prevent this, except for being very, very careful when you're trying to go backwards. So if you're in a closet, if you're in a corner, if you're in a cupboard or, or somewhere where you have to go backwards to get out of it, you have to be extremely careful because it's so easy for people with Parkinson's disease to continue to go backwards, stagger and fall. And again, you don't have a lot of things that can catch you when you're going in that direction. So being aware of it, paying attention to it, using good judgment are definitely the best things for it. Medicine is not exactly great for fixing walking and balance problems. And so even though I would try medicine and I would try changing things and I would try adjusting things, that's a really hard problem to work on. This is something that I would more commonly send to physical therapy to work on walking and balance, to work on gait, even work on walking backwards in some instances. They are much better at trying to treat that than medicine is, and that's probably where I would go to. Is Celebrex safe to use with Parkinson's disease medicines? I think so. Um, I don't think there's any contraindication as far as I know. I'm pretty sure I have patients on Celebrex with, with all the medicines that I use. Again, I'll have to, it, that's, that's my opinion. Nothing is ringing a bad bell that suggests, no, that's a bad combination. You may look it up and find, oh, there's a problem. And then I'll have to go back and rescind what I just said. But as far as it's registering in my head right now, I can't think of any, any contraindication there that says you can't use Celebrex. 
update on Ambroxol. Liar. You were definitely taking a shot at me about exercise. I'm just kidding. Believe me, you should always call into question everything that I say too. Everything I say is an opinion, including my opinions about exercise, which are strong. Uh, so you should not just take what I say with a grain of salt. You should actually do your own fact checking and things like that. I like it. Is it at all likely that a very intelligent person without much, if any, cognitive impairment could beat the psych eval for DBS? Yeah, could beat. I like that. Beat the psych eval for DBS. If so, might it turn out that, that the DBS might be less successful? So the, the cognitive screen for DBS is not because that helps us decide who's going to respond well to the surgery in terms of your physical symptoms. It's, it's really trying to prevent people who are heading towards dementia from getting there quicker, which is what the DBS can do. Again, anytime we put holes into your brain, we put wires into your brain, you know, that can tip you towards more memory problems. But the short answer is yes. The neurocognitive testing is designed for everybody. And I've seen this not necessarily in my Parkinson's patients who I'm trying to send for DBS, but I've definitely seen it in some dementia people where I'm sending to get an evaluation where clearly they've developed some cognitive problems, but they they do perfectly on the test. And the reason is that if you take somebody who starts way up here in their cognitive abilities, and let's say you know the test is designed for average here, and they go from here to here, they've they've dropped significantly, but they're still better than average. And so they're still actually going to test pretty well on that cognitive testing. That is one of the downsides of the limitations to that type of testing. And I have run into that in some of my more memory problem patients than Parkinson's patients. Um, but at the end of the day, that is something that we take into consideration. But when we're doing the neurocognitive testing for the deep brain stimulator evaluation, I think it's a little less important because at the end of the day, I, I still think if you're doing that well, we can get away with doing DBS. And I don't think that's what we use to, discern, to decide who's going to be successful from a deep brain stimulator candidate. It is worth mentioning those. And so again, if there's a lot of cognitive complaints or concerns, definitely bring it up when we're talking about DBS, because that is something we have to keep in mind and we need to think about. <clears throat> Oof. Apathy is so tough. What would you, your initial treatment strategy, thoughts for treating apathy in order to give patients a little more energy push so they can get moving again and are able to increase their exercise routines? The exercise will eventually improve everything overall and eliminate the apathy and the treatment can be stopped. That's a great question because you hit the nail on the head. Apathy is one of the biggest problems that I get in my office, even bigger than depression. And, and the reason is, is that depression tends to respond to the antidepressants. Apathy does not. Apathy is a much more difficult problem to work on. So what is apathy? Apathy is really the lack of motivation, the lack of desire to do things, really not wanting to do things you used to like to do. It's different than depression because they're not usually that upset about it. They just don't care. And that is a really hard problem to work on. It does not, in my experience, respond well to antidepressants. It doesn't respond well to more dopamine medicine or Parkinson's disease drugs. It doesn't even respond to the stimulants, which I've tried. The only thing that I've ever come across and continue to find that works for apathy or helps with motivation is exercise. But again, now you're going to hit me with, well, how am I supposed to exercise if I'm apathetic and I don't have any motivation? And it becomes this this vicious cycle. And, and I agree. And I don't have a great answer for you. I'll oftentimes send these types of patients for physical therapy where they make you exercise. And so maybe that'll be enough to jumpstart things. Some of the dopamine agonists like paramipexol maybe help a little bit with motivation, but not really. Some of the stimulants maybe help like methylphenidate or modafinil. But at the end of the day, this is a really challenging problem. And I'm not entirely sure I have a good answer for you. <clears throat> Do I know of the benefits of for PD for ping pong and the benefits of improv? Yeah, both. Uh, so there was a, a article actually, I think that came out in AARP or something that suggested ping pong was really good for Parkinson's disease. And there was some suggestion that it's really the hand-eye coordination, the thought process behind ping pong and the speed of processing behind ping pong that helps. And I think that might help too. But anything that gets you up, gets you active, gets you moving, I'm all for because that I definitely feel like helps. Improv is interesting because, again, it, with improv, you're making things up on the spot. And that really is a speed of processing, a thought 
exercise that that I think could actually help. And, and so at the end of the day, I think both are good. Anything that makes you think more quicker, anything that makes you get up and move and exercise and be active, I think the benefits are, are written in there in themselves. And I, I'm all for all of them. So definitely do as much as you can. Keep getting up. Keep getting active. Pickleball is the same. I, that was the last thing I just got put on there. Uh, again, a lot of my patients, pickleball is probably the fastest growing thing in the country. 10 years ago, Casey, maybe you remember whenever, so David and I actually played in, in the first pickleball tournament that, that benefited the Parkinson's foundation. I can't remember how long ago it was, but that was like the first time I'd ever heard of pickleball. Now it's everywhere. Now there's courts everywhere. It, it's huge. Everybody's getting involved, not just people with Parkinson's disease or elder population or disabilities. It's everywhere. Um, and I love it. Exercise, getting up, moving, you know, the article about ping pong really was suggesting that, or the guy who wrote that really was suggesting that any racketed sport is really good for decision making, speed of processing, thought process, so on and so forth. And I really do think there's something to it. You know, using your brain to think, think quicker, using your body to get up and move, these are all really good things for you. I highly recommend everybody do as much as they can. Um, and, and yeah, I'm on board with all of those things. Keep doing the best you can. And with that, I know I went over time, but Casey made me late anyway. So I'm going to stop there again. I'm going to, I got a couple things to look up. I wrote them down on my sticky notes and everybody who comes to my office knows that sticky notes are the way that I remember everything. And so I'll look those up for next time and I'll get back to you. Um, otherwise again, we'll do it again next month, which I have no idea what the date is, but Casey might, and I will pass you back to her. As long as you guys keep throwing out questions or keep having questions or keep coming to the table with questions, I'll keep doing it. Casey, it's all yours. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Licklider. The next talk with the doc is on Thursday, October 5th, same time, same place. And um, we hope to see you this Saturday at Step Forward. Go to our website if you'd like to register. It's not too late. You can also just come to Step Forward on Saturday. It's from 11 a.m. until 3 p.m. at the Pittsburgh Shrine Center Picnic Pavilion in Cheswick. We'd love to have you. And one last thing, there's a pickleball for Parkinson's session actually starting um, in the South Hills uh, next week. So we're talking about pickleball, for instance, um, at Westminster Presbyterian Church. I had a little info in the newsletter recently. But thank you all. Hope to see you on Saturday or another time soon. And thank you, Dr. Licklider. This will be on the YouTube channel. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice evening. Good night, Casey. Goodbye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you.